Welcome to Luke Law, a quick deep dive into a folklore topic where I share some of the stories from around the world that have piqued my interest. We're swinging for the fences on this one and tackling some big well-known subjects in a look at modern cryptids. It feels weird I haven't done this yet. I occasionally pop into more recent stories, but even when I take on something like Nessie, they're normally with quite the expansive history. But this selection is among the true new wave, stories with relatively recent histories. While we will usually look at something with thousands of years of weight behind them, these young whippersnappers may not have even been around for a hundred years yet. Let's take our first dedicated look at modern era cryptids. The big guy himself. I can't in good conscience approach this topic without going big out of the gate and talking about Bigfoot. Which then becomes weird because when you try to talk about Bigfoot in the context of a modern cryptid, wild man and ape-like creatures, potential missing links, have been around for a long time. By around, I mean the whole world. And by a long time, I mean so long these could actually be oral tradition stories of other hominids passed down through the ages. Native Americans have assorted ape-man stories with as many variations as there are tribes. The Himalayas have had the Yeti, the Aboriginal Australians have the Yowie, European Deepwoods have many a strange wild man story. There are some theories that these are just assorted burrs across the ages, but that's incredibly reductive and basically calling a quote-unquote uncivilized people dumb. People who live in the wild know what a damn burr is. The ones who didn't ended up as burr food. So potential missing links are as old as mankind, and may even have a basis in anthropology. But something strange happened around 60 odd years ago. Americans started going fanatical for a modern interpretation of these stories, and modern day Bigfoot was born. The sightings began, the stories were spread, and thousands of eyewitness accounts began to pile up, of which only a handful can be chalked up to confirmed hoaxes. Bigfoot became the name that really stuck, as in 1958, a picture of a man named Jerry Crew was circulated, holding up a plaster cast of an alleged Sasquatch track. The actual origin of the name is all over the place. Burrs re-entered a story, as there are two instances of rampaging killer burrs getting a nickname, and there were some Native Americans who picked up the name due to their immense size. But once the wire service spread this story of the track being cast, Bigfoot, as we now know them, was brought into the mainstream. Since then, who doesn't know the big guy? Tracks and photographs tend to blow up in the press, even when they're obvious fakes so long as they're good enough to grab attention with. Pop culture has certainly embraced Bigfoot. I grew up watching Harry and the Hendersons, which was a film so popular in the 80s it turned to a sitcom that got three whole seasons, and if there wasn't proof online it existed, I'd probably have written that off as a fever dream. Bigfoot hunting remains incredibly popular as reality TV of very varied quality. I myself am not much sold on this branch of cryptozoology, which sounds odd given how much weird stuff there is I'm involved in. But one thing is totally undeniable. A lot of people absolutely love Bigfoot. They're one of the best known cryptids, and I doubt we'll ever see people tiring of searching for them. The wild places of North America are vast, and only empty by a metric of how few people there are. Other things beyond the scope of human civilization? Well... Anywhere you could walk for days never seeing a sign of another person could hold literally anything. And there sure are plenty of eyewitness accounts. So, who knows? I think I'll leave this one as a Bigfoot overview. I could easily do just a show on variations alone. I haven't even touched upon the Florida Skunk Ape, the Malaysian Orang Minyak, or the Mapinguari of South America. These just being the regional variations, there are even weird stories within the subsets such as the Bigfoot that was known for throwing snakes at human observers. Sorry to tease all these more and run, but I'll be back to them one day and we have plenty more cool modern era cryptids to cover. The Prophet of Doom Now this is something of an odd one even by cryptid standards, and digging into their history recently is what inspired this episode the Mothman of Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Here's the first odd thing about the Mothman. Mothman? Not a moth. The first report in 1966 with the incredible newspaper heading Couple, see, man-sized bird, creature, something, had the couple who went to the press describe a tall grey figure with ten-foot wings and the eyes of this figure lighting up red when they caught the light of the car's headlights before it flew away. As soon as this first reported story hit the local papers, more sightings began to flood in. 
Some people just reported a giant grey bird, others leaning more into a human-like figure with wings, yet all had the iconic red reflective eyes in the night. None actually included any moth characteristics though. Blame the press for calling them the Mothman, but that well and truly stuck. Half a century of pop culture osmosis meaning that the depictions of the Mothman well and truly look like a moth now, but that's on the journalists originally looking for a catchy hook. If anything, they're more like an owl, and could have deeper ties into Native American folklore that sees owls as a bad omen, since there's the next odd thing about the Mothman, the supposedly a portent of doom. Not one that messes around either. This isn't stub your toe, lose your car keys levels of doom. This is collapsing bridge with mass fatalities level of doom. The 1975 book The Mothman Prophecies, plus later the film of the same name which follows journalists covering their 60s sightings, has a pretty dark theory. The claim being that the Mothman either predicted, or else possibly even caused, the 1967 collapse of the Silver Bridge crossing the Ohio River. Even with this much time, it's a rough topic to raise. This is the deadliest bridge disaster in US history. It was like an opening out of a Final Destination movie. A crack only millimetres in length resulted in a single eye bar suddenly fracturing, which dislodged a pin holding it in place. Then the whole thing, this massive bridge, unravelled. A quote from a witness at the time, Charlene Wood, gives me chills over this. It was like someone had lined up dominoes. I could see car lights flashing as they were tumbling into the water. The car in front of me went in. Then there was silence. Charlene Wood was pregnant at the time, and she reversed her car when the bridge started swaying. Swaying so badly the movement of the bridge stalled her car, ultimately leaving her and her unborn baby stranded four feet from the precipice when the whole thing went. I mentioned the eye bar that cracked. This was a case of the lowest bidder getting the job. These things were used instead of the steel cables you would see on suspension bridges, and they weren't possible to check and maintain properly. This resulted in 46 people lost to the freezing waters below. This went darker than I intended, sorry. Let's get back to the Mothman. The author of the Chronicles book insists that the Mothman was spotted on the bridge right before the disaster, this linking the cryptid to the disaster itself. The consensus seems to be they were an omen of the disaster and not a cause, which makes the connection a little less uncomfortable. Modern sightings do still occur, although what exactly the modern photographs are is heavily debated. Some UFOologists have embraced the Mothman and claimed there were Russian sightings ahead in the 1999 apartment bombings in Moscow. But the primary Mothman story remains pretty firmly fixed as a town in West Virginia between November 15th, 1966 and December 15th, 1967. Point Pleasant has a permanent museum celebrating the cryptid and an annual festival, the Mothman being a firm favourite of locals. Spoil Sports will insist that the original sighting was probably just a confused giant-sized heron with reddish eyes that had strayed off of its migration path, and that modern pictures must surely be those of an owl carrying something. But the Mothman is ultimately a very popular piece of modern folklore, with fans around the world and statues in their honour where their story began. A Vampire for Livestock If someone hadn't heard of La Chubacabra, it's probably because they simply know it as the Goat Sucker. Despite how well known they are, this is an incredibly recent cryptid on the scene, with stories emerging in the late 90s. Although, now I say that, I realise that's over 20 years ago, so excuse me while I crumble to dust from being ancient. Uh, anyway, this began in Puerto Rico in 1995. A woman named Madeline Tolentino spotted something monstrous outside of her window, which was at least fortunately as scared of her, and it ran for it. From there, the bodies began to drop. Again, fortunately not people. Sucks to be the goats who got sucked though, and over assorted livestock to boot. Animals would be found dead from loss of blood, with puncture marks on their necks and no clear sign of the missing blood. It seemed pretty obvious from there. You begin to see strange monsters, and then animals turn up drained of blood, then you're adding two and two to get creepy Dracula thing on the loose. The story spread around the island, then over to the rest of Latin America, then up into the southern United States, looking alarmingly like a spreading invasive species. Descriptions can vary wildly beyond just the general size and freakiness. They come in at four or five feet tall, standing bipedal either like some sort of weird kangaroo or just a hunched over humanoid. They're usually grey or green, sometimes described as lizard-like, usually with convenient for goat puncturing fangs, and sometimes with spikes going down the body. All I can say is that I'm glad they're skittish in nature, behaving like wild animals that want nothing to do with us. 
especially when you get to stories of them running around on rooftops. They're definitely not a visitor I'd want to wake up to in the bedroom, and if that ever did happen, I'd be very happy that it went back out the window and off into the night away from me. This being a recent story, the UFOologists have tried to claim them as alien visitors, but their behaviour seems to track with wild animals making them an alarming to encounter cryptid vermin more than anything else. La Chubacarpa panics do sometimes end up with mundane explanations though. I think it was episode 1 or 2 of the main show where it was only a marauding pack of coyote with manji in one instance, which is somehow not that comforting when you say it out loud, but murdering packs of ill and pissed off regular wildlife don't come close to answering every case of sightings, with the thankfully shy bloodsuckers managing to avoid much in the way of being caught on camera so far. But when you look at the big picture, they do look an awful lot like something weird came out of the jungles and found easy pickings to spread into. Should you find yourself with a visiting La Chubacabra, please don't try and make friends with it. My gut is telling me here it's for the best to keep them wild and scared of humans. Just leave them to it while locking up your animals at night. Weird legs taking themselves for a walk. This is the most obscure offering this episode, the other three stories being cryptid superstars, but I have a soft spot for these little weirdos. Nightcrawlers. Not the band, nor the books. The Fresno Nightcrawlers. Sometimes also called the Fresno Aliens, because recent cryptids have a huge problem with fans of the X-Files trying to claim them as proof of visiting life from another world, when they're most likely just something weird from ours. But seriously, even Bigfoot isn't safe from that. They don't seem to do much by any report, they just walk across open spaces looking weird, but it's the fact that they happily do it on camera that makes them so interesting. Should Moist Bob the town drunk stumble into the liquor store yelling about legs walking on their own, he gets to sleep off in the cells and no one pays the tale any mind. But when videos turn up showing something this strange, it has a little more credibility. It's pretty easy to find pictures and videos of them online. They certainly aren't shy creatures. They stand out, pardon the pun, as they have no torso, no arms and no head. They're just legs going for a wander. It's possible the weird wind-powered art installations, stuff similar to this has been unleashed upon beaches around the world to inject a little wonder into life, but they tend to end up crashing into a hedge somewhere, leaving examinable remains and an artist to claim them. The Fresno Nightcrawlers just kind of… turned up, stretched the legs, buggered off, and no one has so far managed to grab one. Which seems sensible really, as while they might only be legs, they're quite a lot of leg. Estimates have them at 5 foot tall, and there's something just uncanny enough about them that would even give me pause before poking them with a stick to see what happens. They've only been sighted 3 times since 2010, although the videos get heavily circulated since they're so damn weird and have yet to be explained. First in Fresno, California. Then in Yosemite Park, California. Then, weirdly, and harder to verify due to extreme shaky cam, they have apparently gone for a stroll in Poland. Being an internet age cryptid, the Fresno Nightcrawlers have enjoyed a whole heap of random misinformation from bored people muddying the water. People joining in making their own videos with either CGI or by puppeteering pairs of pants. Some git even tried to make up a story tied into local Native American folklore, but that was handily debunked and BOO on that person. But the imitators are always pretty easy to shoot down, and the main videos have been stubbornly difficult to easily explain away. Nothing worrying about them, just some legs stretching themselves. Wait and see now for if any further footage or information comes to light. That's all for this episode. I doubt this is the last we'll hear from these cryptids, both in the wider world and on Luke Law. The missing links from around the world easily could be revisited as their own showcase, so definitely let me know if that's something you would like sooner rather than later, and also drop any tips on what specific stories you'd like me to look into with these. I would once again like to give a shout out to the Blue Pint Society. Testicular Cancer Awareness brought to you via appreciation of craft brewery and some awesome merchandise. Definitely swing through and give them a look, if not some heartfelt support, at bluepintsociety.com. Mark Semler chucked me some funds for a movie rental and a fancy coffee over Christmas. Not for a plug, just to be nice because he's a cool dude. But I'm easily bought and Blue Pint Society is a great cause. If you do want to contact me, there's the show's dedicated email, lukelawgsg at gmail.com, and the general show email, ghoststoryguys at gmail.com. Both myself and the main show are really easy to find on Facebook and Twitter if you want to make day-to-day -day contact, as well as there being a very active Instagram account a lot of the community gets involved with. 
Luke Law has an Instagram account now too, although we're still just finding our feet with that one. I'm gearing up to keep that one folklore message focused. Suggestions very welcome with that one. If you want to support the show directly, definitely check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash ghoststoryguys. It'll get you access to all sorts of GSG goodies at different tiers. My incentive being that Luke Law episodes go out to patrons early. As ever though, the absolute best thing anyone can do to support the show is to give it a listen. Share this around if you think you may know someone who may be interested, leave a review if you get the chance to help signal boost me, and most of all, I simply hope you enjoy what I'm doing here. Goodbye for now.